Kevin Ioli from Yahoo Sports, and I know you know this guy, the president of the UFC, Dana White. We live in the same town, Dana, but uh, we are not very close. Uh, we are a little bit away. You are in Thailand. I am. It's beautiful out here. It's my first time. I've never been. You've never been to Thailand, and I understand as you've been there, you ran into a couple of ex-UFC fighters. So uh, you ran into Mike Swick, uh, who we all know uh, was a former competitor in the middleweight division. What's he up to these days? Yeah, you know, he built a gym out here, a.k.a. Thailand, and it's incredible. It's it's one of the nicest places I've ever been as far as the gym goes. Um, he's got a restaurant uh, there, like a restaurant that cooks nothing but healthy food. Uh, he's got weights. He's got cardio equipment. they got a full uh, mixed martial arts training area. He's got a store. He's got a full Muay Thai and boxing training area. He's got incredible trainers. It's set in the jungle. And it overlooks the water. It's it's. I'm so happy for this guy. It is very impressive. I've always liked and Mike. What he does is, you know, you know, they're, they're, we're only like nine hours from Russia here, um, and a lot of Russians come down. Oh, really? And, and people come and just fly here to train at AKA Thailand, and they stay down here, and they go and they train every day, and they stay down here for weeks, some for months. It's pretty cool. Is Cody Garbrandt there? Have you run into him? I know he's been posting pictures of he was in Thailand. He was. He left right before I got here. Ah. Yeah, he was here. He was He was with Mike Swick, too. So, you know, I just think people don't understand what you go through sometimes. Uh, and I, I don't know. I know nobody feels sorry for you and what you do because you live a great life. But <laughs> uh, your travel schedule always ceases to amaze me. Tell people sort of what you're doing. You're leaving Thailand when and where are you going? Yeah, this is this is actually my first. I'm actually traveling 25 days this month, uh, the month of January. <clears throat> 11 of it is is vacation, which I've been ready for for a while, and then the rest is as soon as I get I get back Thursday, and then Friday um, I fly to St. Louis for for the, for the fight uh, with uh, Stevens and Duho Choi, and then um, then and I get back. You know, late Sunday night, early Monday morning, and Tuesday I go to Boston for Stipe versus Engano, and uh, and the list. I just I get back and I have to go somewhere else, and the the rest of the month. Then in early February, I'm flying to Perth for the uh, for the Perth event. We're going to talk about that Perth event because I saw some stuff on social media about who might be fighting on that card, and uh, I know uh, Dan Hooker also uh, not to a great ovation in Las Vegas, but uh, made a plea to fight on that card. So uh, I just, I'll ask you about that in a bit. But uh, let, first of all, and before we get into the interview, the meat and potatoes of what I want to talk to you about, uh, a few years ago, people may remember you donated some money to a, a, a young Thai girl, uh, the daughter of a fighter. Uh, you actually met her yesterday. Uh, fill, fill me in on that story. Yeah, so you know, the uh, I was on the internet one day, and there was a guy's rant, crazy plea to save this little girl's life. It was two and a half, and he and he really pointed me out. And a lot of people gave him some slack in the way that he was talking to me, like you you should do this, and you know yada yada yada, but. The guy talked to me the way that I talk, and 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 I I understood what he was saying, and I, and I said, you know what, this guy's right. I the, so basically, the little girl needed liver, you know, emergency liver surgery, right? And I can't, and and if she didn't get it in two weeks, she was going to die, mm. and it cost fifty thousand dollars. And I said, I have fifty thousand dollars, and I should do this. So I didn't even hesitate. I I, I sent the money. She had the surgery and and she lived. And I've been hearing stories about her and, you know, all these things from Thailand. People who had met her and seen her right. would come back to me and say, oh my God, I met her. And um, so now I, I came out here and I had the opportunity. So Mike Swick set it up for us to meet. And and I met her. We hung out uh, a couple days ago and it was awesome. She's beautiful and she's the sweetest thing in the world. And her family are really nice, good people. And then um, last night we went to the Muay Thai fights together, and she sat with me at the Muay Thai fights. Oh and, uh, wow, that's awesome! It was awesome. So, so now I'm going to fly her and her family out to Vegas to come to a UFC event, 
you know, I, I want to have a relationship with her. I don't want that to be the last time I ever see her. So, yeah. Do you feel um, a lot uh, special, Kim, because you saved her life and, you know, the fact that you were able to do that? Do you feel some bond with her that you might not have otherwise with a, uh, a kid on the other side of the world? Oh, 100%. 100%. It's one of the greatest things I've ever done. It's one of the greatest things I've ever done in my life. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm so, I feel so lucky that I was, you know, able to do it and that, I don't know. It just all came together. I got on the internet that day. I read that thing. I pulled the trigger. I did it. And thank God I did it. It's one of the greatest things ever in my life. Well, I appreciate it. I know you're on vacation, so I don't want to keep you uh, talking about stuff that uh, the fans, they want to hear about your impressions of the fights. And you didn't make it to the 219 uh, press conference in Las Vegas the other day. And a lot of people wanted to ask you, I was blown away with uh, Khabib and his performance in the win over Edson Barbosa. I mean, that was like, wow. I figured Khabib would win the fight, Dana, but I thought, hey, Barbosa is, is pretty, you know, pretty good fighter. And I thought Barbosa It's going to be a war. Yeah. He came in magnificent condition. I mean, you saw him, and it was like, wow, he was good. Uh, what was your take on uh, how Khabib looked? He looked phenomenal. You know, Khabib has a lot of followers and, and you know, uh, has a really big backing, and a lot of people are always like, Khabib time, Khabib time. Now it's Khabib time. Khabib came in. He was in great shape, made weight easy, um, and made Edson Barbos look easy. Edson Barboza is a stud. The guy is such a good fighter, such a good stand-up fighter, has been working um, so much on his takedown defense and his wrestling, um, and, and he's a super dangerous guy. And he even landed an unbelievable head kick yes, he did. On, um, on Khabib that Khabib walked through like nothing. Khabib looks like an unbelievable force. The guy is is a star in the making, and uh, you know, now everybody wants to see Khabib versus Connor. And I was gonna say, he seems to me, to my mind, to be kind of a nightmare matchup for Connor. You know, I've learned not to underestimate McGregor uh, because he's beaten. You know, hey, he beat Jose Aldo in 13 seconds, called his shot, nonetheless. You know, he said he was gonna do it, and he did. He, he beat Jose Aldo in 13 seconds, and if you look at the um, if you if you look at the fight between Eddie Alvarez and Gaethje. Gaethje, undefeated, two tough guys, absolute war. Unbelievable, incredible fight, and look at how easy Conor made it look. Yeah. So the thing is, Khabib is incredible. Conor McGregor, as much as and everybody wants to, Conor always finds a way to win. And when Conor hits you, you go. When he hits you, you go. Um, I, I, I love that matchup. But, you know, Tony Ferguson is the interim champion. And, uh, you know, Connor and I haven't really haven't really figured out, out, you know, when he's coming back and what's going on. So Connor has some some big decisions to make here really quick. If, if if he waits, I don't think Connor wants to fight until August. But if he waits until August, that's on or September. That's that's around two years since the belt has been defended. And that can't happen. And you made a comment to ESPN, you know, and a lot of people got upset. I, I think I know what you were trying to say, but, like, you know, they, the, the simple fact is fighters make more money when they fight for and hold titles, right? And if he isn't defending that lightweight championship, he never did put the uh, featherweight championship up. Other fighters don't get a chance to make that life-altering money. So even though he's fought a lot of tough guys, I agree with you, he has an obligation to the, the sport to, to defend the title, doesn't he? And to the other fighters. Not only to the sport, to the, but to the other fighters. This is a game of time. You know what I mean? Time is your enemy in this sport or any other sports. When you're a professional athlete, time is your enemy. And we can't let this thing go on forever and not give other guys the opportunity. Tony Ferguson has been around for a long time and, and, and has uh, earned his dues. Khabib has earned his dues. And the list goes on and on. So Connor has, has done very well. He's made a lot of money. And... If he decides that he doesn't want to fight again for another however long, that's that's up to him. That's that's his choice and his decision. But the the belt has to move on, and, and uh, so we got we got to figure some stuff out here in the next couple months. Two other questions about him. You know, he's had a couple small incidents. You know, and he was recently in court for the speeding violation. He got the judge very upset at him uh, with his behavior, and and media in Ireland is saying he's hanging around with some less than savory characters. I'm not in Ireland, so I don't know that. Uh, but asking you, are you concerned at all about what he's doing? 
No, uh, I'm not. I'm not going to listen. Conor McGregor hasn't been as bad as some other people that we have under contract. So, you know, speeding tickets and, and things like that. Um, th- that's, that's pretty normal stuff for, uh, young, super wealthy, uh, famous, you know, <laughs> athletes or whatever. Um, the, the stuff that I've heard about him, uh, crossing paths with gangsters and things like that is totally not true. That's what I hear. That's what he tells me. Um, you know, Connor has always been solid with me. So, so the fight I in the bar was – now you ta- you had a chance to talk to him about that. Where he supposedly hit a gangster. Yeah, he said it's all bullshit. Okay, so he didn't happen. All right, um, that's good enough there. Then uh, go on on uh, uh, Khabib. How do you go? Do you put Khabib with Tony Ferguson and have the winner fight Connor, or do you put Connor and uh, Tony yeah. together to unify the belt? What's next? Yeah, I mean, we as long as Connor is willing to fight by March, we could do Khabib versus Tony. You know what I mean? We could do Khabib versus Tony, and then the winner fights uh, fights Connor for the title. Um, or Connor doesn't want to fight and wants to sit out until you know next fall. Then we, we would have to make Khabib versus Tony for the title, not the interim title. Is it going to be difficult financially to get a Connor fight done? Because after you make the kind of money he's made in that Mayweather fight, and also when you take in what he's got, you know, I mean, financially it's going to take a big, a big hit to get him back, right? Yeah. No, I, I think that you know, first of all, Con- Connor's a smart kid. Connor is a very smart guy. He, he's, he's not. Uh, uh, he, he gets what happened in the Floyd fight. Th- those are fucking unicorns. Those kind of fights. Okay. Um, and I've never been afraid to pay Conor McGregor money. Conor brings the money in. And, uh, you know, we've laid out a really nice offer for him. And uh, he's a smart kid. I think we'll figure it out. I've always figured it out with him. I've always ended up getting a deal done with Conor McGregor. The question is, and, and you're right, is does he have so much money that he doesn't care anymore and he doesn't really want to fight? Right. You know, that. but that's up to him. But in no way, shape, or form am I asking him to come back and not make money because he's going to make money. As a fan of MMA and, and a fan of his, I like watching him fight. You know, I would love to see him come back. But as a person that knows what the fight game does to you, it's like, why do it again? Why put your family through that? And it's a, it's it's a tough choice. And uh, has he given given you any indication? Well, moment? the answer the answer to that the answer to that is because he can still make a lot more money. Um, you'd be surprised how fast you can rip through seventy five million bucks. You know what I mean? A hundred million bucks. When the government makes half of it and uh, you're left with half and, and Connor likes really nice things, you know, he likes the watches and the cars and the clothes and the houses and, you know, the private jets and all that stuff, renting yachts. Um, the money runs out quicker than you think it would. And he's in a position now where he's still young. He's super talented and uh, he can make a lot of money to really change his, his life for, forever. Let, let's move on to the main event, uh, which was the fight of the night at UFC 219. Chris Cyborg uh, won a unanimous decision over Holly Holm. Uh, I scored it four rounds to one for Chris. I gave round one to Holly. And I, round two, as the fight was going on, I was leaning toward Holly, but the latter part of the round, I, I ended up giving it to Chris. And I thought three, four, and five, she clearly uh, won those rounds. So I had it four rounds to one. How did, first of all, how did you score it? Yeah, well, I, I don't, I don't, I didn't really score. Score the fight, you know, like round by round, but I had Cyborg winning the fight easily. Um, has there been controversy since I've been gone about who won the fight? Yeah, there's just a couple of people thought, you know, it, 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 the three two scores were bad. They didn't. Everybody thought Cyborg won the fight. They didn't. They didn't have an issue with uh, um, that. They had an issue with the three two score. They thought it might have been five zero. Yeah. Okay. Because the fifth round, oh, so, if yeah. Holly would have won the they, fifth they, round, they she would have won the fight. That it was... Right? If what? If Holly would have won the fifth round, she would have won the fight on the judges' scorecards. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Holly won rounds one and two on two of the three judges' scorecards. And she split rounds one and two on the third judges' card. So had she won the fifth, she would have won a majority decision. Holy shit. So, yeah, that's crazy. No, I had Cyborg winning the fight easily. So I thought, I thought Holly I, put on a great performance, and, and it was a great fight. Obviously, fight of the night. Holly came to fight. 
you know, Holly is always, uh, you know, she got in there and she slugged with, with, with Cyborg, man. She, she, she fought with her. She hit her with a lot of punches. And in my opinion, the toughest fight, you know, in MMA that Cyborg's ever had. Holly, uh, one question about her. She's forgotten more about fighting than I would ever know. But, you know, I thought there were two things that she did in the fight that, that I questioned. You know, she seemed to be moving towards Cyborg's power all the time, you know, uh, circling the wrong, what I would think would be the wrong way. And she didn't use her jab, which she has a fairly good jab. Did that strike you at all sitting there watching the fight? Yeah, I just know how her, her style, she's a counter puncher. And she sits back and waits and lets you, you know, when you come with your offense, she throws her, you know, her counter punches. And that's the type of fight I expected. I expected faster head kicks from her. I thought that her head kicks, I thought she was going to land some, some, some head kicks during the fight more than, than what she did. Do you think maybe the extra 10 pounds, she was just that little bit slower, you know, that, that reaction time is a little bit quicker because she was bulked up a little bit? I don't know. She, she looked good, though. She looked bigger than Cyborg, man. Yeah, she, she, she she was big, strong, but I, th I think you want to come into a fight with Chris Cyborg. I was impressed with her clinch work. You know, she seemed like the stronger fighter in the clinch. And, and you know, I thought, and I wrote this, I thought that Chris, you know, she, so many people say she won fights because she was bigger than everybody else, and she simply overwhelmed them with her size and strength. But I thought she showed a pretty good MMA game there, and, uh, and she showed she was a complete fighter. Would you agree with that? Yeah, she was very poised and very controlled, and didn't try to go crazy. And I think, I think the reason is, is because she showed Holly Holm a lot of respect. She knew, you know, listen, I can't be running in there, uh, you know, throwing crazy punches. I need to take my time, pick my shots. And that's the type of fight she fought that night. And she needed to, because, because Holly Holm is, is, is a very tough opponent. I feel sorry for Chris because she's been through so much and now she's sitting here, the champ, she's on top of the world, her biggest win that she's had and she wins the fight, and all of a sudden now, who does she fight next? She said uh, on Sunday, I believe it was, or maybe yesterday, that she's been contacted about fighting Megan Anderson. At the press conference, she said she wanted to fight Megan Anderson but hadn't heard anything about it. Now she says she's been contacted. I know you're in Thailand, so maybe you haven't been in contact. Has she been contacted about that? I've been, trust me, I'm in contact. Um, you know, first of all, Amanda Nunes wants to fight her. Okay. Amanda Nunes wants to fight Cyborg. Right. That is the fight to make, and that is the fight I will make. Okay. Um, yeah, that's the fight. That's the fight. You know, Amanda Nunes is a big, strong, powerful puncher. You know, she, I think she matches up very well with Cyborg, too, and I think that's a fun fight, and that's, that's the fight to make. Okay. Any time frame for that, or is it still early? I don't, well, Cyborg wants to fight, so... Um, we'll, we'll get her a fight as soon as we can get it done. You know, as soon as, uh, Amanda can, can prepare and get ready for this fight, we're ready to roll. I, I, you know, you hear the Brazilian fighters say this a lot and Chris said it on uh, Saturday or Saturday night after the fight, I would rather not fight another Brazilian fighter. Uh, when push comes to shove, do you think that might come up at all? And will that be a problem in making the fight? Listen, when you're the world champion, it doesn't matter if you're fighting a Brazilian a uh, German, a Puerto Rican, a friggin', you know, Cuban, whoever. You, you fight whoever comes and tries to take your belt from you. Okay. To move on, you know, I love a heavyweight, a good heavyweight fight. And I talk, you know, some of these big heavyweight fights. And uh, I wrote about a year ago, I said, if this plays out right, Stipe and Francis Ngannou could be the biggest fight in UFC history. I mean, you know, I was hoping that Stipe would have fought two or three times in a year and, you know, Francis would have done what he did. Uh, so maybe it's not going to be the biggest fight in UFC history, but it's going to be a heck of a fun fight, and I'm really looking forward to it. And I wonder your level of excitement uh, for this bout relative to other ones, because this seems like uh, one of those fights that's a Dana White special in Boston and two massive guys going at it. That seems like the kind of fight you would love. This fight is awesome. I can't wait. When we put together that promo uh, for those guys, I, I watched it 650 times. I love it. I mean, two knockout punchers, two guys who come forward and try to finish you. Um, it, it is the perfect heavyweight matchup. It's one of the, if not the best heavyweight fight we've ever done, one of the best ever in the history of the UFC. Um it's in Boston. The thing sold out immediately. That Thursday, I've told you, I'm going in Tuesday and starting to do PR. 
Thursday, the Celtics play the uh, 76ers. Then Saturday is the heavyweight championship. And then Sunday is the AFC championship in Boston. You think I'm going to have fun that week? Well, that'll be when the Steelers beat the Patriots. Is that what you're talking about? Oh, you're nuts, dude. You, you, hey, you. we already saw that movie, pal. We already saw that movie. Thank you, referees. Thank you, referees. <laughs> oh, referees. <laughs> we sh- hey, uh, did your opinion of Francis uh, change after what he did to Overeem? I mean, you know, I, I figured he's going to beat Alistair, but uh, what he did was pretty special. Yeah, no, I was always into this guy for the last, I mean, it's somebody we've been focused on for, uh, for the last uh, year and a half. And yeah, but I didn't expect, I mean, when, when you see the way that punch, it's like something out of a movie, uh, um, su- super impressive. Well, Steve Bay, obviously, you know, he, he knocked out, uh, Verdum. Uh, I know one of your favorites, uh, going backwards with a jab. I mean, uh, you know, that was an incredible, when you think of that, I mean, Anderson Silva is the only other fighter I've ever seen do that. Uh, I've seen guys hurt people with jabs. I've seen guys knock people down with jabs. But to knock them out going backwards, I haven't seen that before. So this fight, you know, has potential to be. But do you think the difference in this fight might be Stipe is a well-rounded guy and he has other aspects to his game, not just stand-up? For all the people that are writing Stipe off because uh, Francis is such a killer, first of all, he's very athletic. He's small, he's fast, and he hits really hard. Um he has a very well-rounded game. His wrestling is great. I mean, this is a very tough fight. This isn't a Francis walks in and just clubs this guy and, and that's it. Don't forget, he just knocked Alistar Overeem out impressively in the first round, too. Right. Uh, Stipe. So this is an incredible heavyweight fight with two incredible athletes, two incredible knockout punchers. Um, I, I, me and Rogan were talking about it the other day. And I can't wait till the lights drop, the music starts, and these two start walking out of the tunnel in Boston. I can't wait. Yeah, no, I'm with you on that one. I think that's going to be a special fight. Uh, last thing, you know, I asked you about uh, Stipe. I mean, he has a good fight IQ, and I don't know that maybe he's given enough credit for that. I, I always look at him and think he's a very smart fighter. Not only is he a great athlete, but it seems like he has a plan, and he knows what he's doing in the, uh, doing in there. And, you know, do you think the fight IQ might be something, too, that, you know, gives him, uh, you know, not to say that Francis is not a smart fighter, but, I mean, Francis isn't as experienced. And Stipe really, in my mind, ha- has a sharp uh, fighter IQ. 100%. And, and that's what I'm saying. Don't sleep on Stipe. Um, you know, as, as the fight, if the fight gets passed and starts to go into the third, fourth, and fifth round, you know what I mean? Francis Ngannou is a big guy. You know, we're, we're going to find out. That's the beauty of these type of fights. We're going to find out. Francis Ngannou is this killer. You know, if he hits you, you know, he's he breaking records. He hits you like a Toyota, whatever the hell it was, or a Ford Escort or whatever the car was and all this stuff. Um, yet you have the, the you know, the, the veteran who's been in there for a long time, the guy who's a small, agile, fast athlete with incredible power. Um, it is the perfect heavyweight fight. Yeah, no, that's going to be a lot of fun. And then finally, let's make one quick little transition here. So I know you're planning to get into the sport of boxing, so uh, I will have to put up with you in two different sports uh, when that happens. So uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. But, uh, you know, for my first question is why? Is it just, you know, that you, you crave a challenge? I mean, it, it doesn't make sense for you, it seems like, to want to go into another sport when you, you work all these years to get MMA up to a point, and now why would you do boxing? Apparently, I don't have enough to do, Kevin, and I need a little bit more on my plate. Um, but I, you know what? I, I When we did the Mayweather fight, I watched and, and you know, took it all in. I just think every, all these guys, I think, you know, the guys who are promoting boxing today are bad at it. I don't think they do a good job, and I think I could do better. Sounds arrogant, but it's the truth. I think I could do a better job than these guys do. Um, you know, think about this, and, and I don't give a shit about – Showtime's fucking full of shit press release they put out. It's the biggest fight ever, ever in combat sports history. The thing did over 6.7 million buys. And if the uh, if the service didn't drop, we would have got closer to 7 million. Okay? Mm-hmm. It, was the, it was the biggest event ever. And it was the biggest boxing event ever without a boxer. 
There was only one boxer involved in the fight. <laughs> well, you were talking um, worldwide and, figures, and they're talking in North America figures. So just to be fair, which I still question. Okay. Yeah. the the way that the way that that they handled that press release and what they did, I didn't trust them before, and now I just they, I despise those fucking guys. Okay, the Showtime guys. I'll I'll never work with them again ever. Um. Mm-hmm. Anyway, but I think we can do it a lot better. A lot better. Um, I think I, I think that 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 we can add, actually add something to the sport. I think that we can. Uh, I think that we can raise the level uh, 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 of the sport of boxing. So I'm interested in doing it. So the the one here's a question: uh, the, the pay scale at the top in boxing is really high, especially relative to UFC. Um, and so you you know I think the one good thing that you did in in MMA was you went and you said, hey, we're going to take the things we like about boxing and keep it and the things we don't like and get rid of it. And one of the things was having just one good fight on a card. So, you know, you have more evenly matched fights on your card. So there's, you know, seven, eight fights on a card sometimes, you know, at least three or four always, but sometimes seven or eight fights where you go, wow, I can't wait to see that fight. Boxing, you can't, right. you can't really do it because you can't budget it right now with what some of the top guys make. And I know you're, you have a relationship with Al Heyman. How do you overcome that? Al Heyman's paying, you know, there, there was talk that Al Heyman, you know, had $500 million. He's already lost $400 million of it uh, trying to make the PBC work. So how do you overcome? These guys aren't going to want to go with you just because you're a nice guy. They're going to want to get paid, right? And right. You know, they, they already yep, have. I hear you. How's it work? HBO. HBO isn't doing as much boxing as, as, as they have. Um, none of the other guys are doing as much boxing as they have. The deal, you know, fucking Aram likes to yap, but his deal isn't great. His deal that he has isn't a great deal. Um, so at the end of the day, over the next couple of years, how, 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 much, uh, how much money are all these guys really going to be making? You know, I believe that, and just because something's been a certain way for so many years doesn't mean it isn't broken, doesn't mean it can't be fixed. Mm-hmm. And I know that there's, there's guys at the top that make a lot of money, and then there's guys on the bottom that don't make anything. You know, um, I, I, could, I could put together a system where all these mid-level guys are making good money, good money, supporting their family, living in good homes, doing all that stuff, and the, the big guys make the big money. You know, the money can be spread evenly. You got to go out and get a, a real TV deal, not the Bob Arum TV deal. You got to go out and get a real TV deal and, and build the same structure that we built in the UFC. Bob Arum talks all this shit. Bob Arum is literally copying every fucking thing that we've done and regurgitating everything that I've said over the last 17 years. They're, you know, I mean, the one thing that they're doing on this deal, I think there's a lot of good coming from it because obviously being on ESPN and ESPN is providing a lot of exposure for boxing, right? I mean, hey, look, they're giving boxing attention, which they have. He's getting a lot of exposure, but for what? Listen, Kevin, well, let me, let me just ask. Fight, when you put on a fight and you actually draw on the numbers and the fucking guy quits because his knuckle hurts, you know what I mean? You're, you're doing the same bullshit where people are turning off the TV and did you. The, you were at the Robbie Lawler fight, right? I was. The guy's leg was destroyed, okay? Blew his ACL and his meniscus and every other thing that's in your knee out in like the third round. Wobbled over to the fence, laid against it, and asked Anjo, Dos Anjos to come in so that they could, just, you know, just bang it out. Robbie Lawler went to the fifth round, you know? And that's one of the big problems that you have. These guys go, go on ESPN and tank. Well, Tank, you th- do you think the people do you think the people that showed up and bought tickets to that fight and left were happy with the performance? They they were not, but I mean, I don't think you blame Aram for that, and I don't think you do. But the thing I, I think no, is, I agree. I'm not blaming Aram. I think the I'm thing not is blaming important. Aram for that. The thing is, there's important. a lot of things to blame Aram for it, so I'm definitely <laughs> not blaming him for that. Once once the fighters step in there, it's out of your hands. Right. It's, it's it's up to them. They have to carry the show. But but that's been a big problem with boxing. Right. You know how many guys I've seen in my day that. That, that know they got their paycheck and that's it, you know? And I have I have ideas to fix this stuff. Okay. I have ways Can you share? to fix it. Can I? Can I? I don't know. I'm not saying, oh, I'm going to come in and I'm going to fix everything and blah, blah, blah. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that I have ideas. I think that I could do it better, and I'm going to give it a shot. 
So you're you're in your mid forties now. When you were, you know, third, what were you in your thirties? I'm in my late forties. <laughs> late, okay. You're being nice to me. Yeah. Well, you're not like me. I'm I'm old. So I when we talk about old, I'm old. You're you're young to me. But uh, I was going to say, you know, you had fifteen years of that grind of MMA to get to where you are right now. Fifteen years of the grind in boxing put you in your sixties. Do you want to be doing this and grinding that way for another fifteen years? Bob Arum's 105 years old. He's still shooting his mouth off and doing stuff, so I don't know. We'll see. My question, though, you know, and here's what I've been trying to ask you, and I think is is really. But it's what. But at the end of the day, Kevin, it's what I love. It's what I love to do. Do what you love. I love making the best fights in the world, and I love sitting there and watching the best fights in the world. I can't imagine that when I'm in my 60s, I'm not going to still love it. So you've got a lot of enemies in boxing and you haven't even promoted boxing yet with Oscar De La Hoya and you and Bob Harum and you and all that. But uh, I got two. So, and you haven't even I promoted boxing. Yeah, got two but I'm actually them. very blown away by how receptive all the other powers that be in boxing are and how they, you know, they're all going to come out and meet with me. I'm choosing not to meet with Bob Arum and Oscar De La Hoya. Um, you know, I, I just... Not my kind of guys. So I want to ask you two other everybody questions. Everybody else is. Let me go two other questions. One, I think one of the good things that's come out of this ESPN deal, Dana, is the uh, you're seeing a younger audience on boxing. When we used to get, I I used to subscribe to the Nielsen ratings. I would get HBO and Showtime's ratings, and the biggest category was always P55 plus people who are 55 and older. And now you're looking in, uh, you know, they, they've had good numbers in 18 to 34. They had good numbers in 18 to 49. They're drawing that younger demographic, um, showing that maybe, you know, before they weren't reaching the audience where they were. So that has to be an encouraging sign that boxing is not dead, that there's interest in boxing. It's just you got to find where the people are, right? Yeah, I agree. And I, and I think that if, uh, if you put on the right fight, you market it the right way, People of all ages, gender, nationalities will all want to watch. Yeah. We're all human beings, and we like fighting, and we will watch it. Where have I heard that before? Uh, and then my 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 last question to you is: you know, Al Heyman, as I said, you know, the PBC. I, I like the I concept of the PBC when when they he first announced it. And I'll tell you this story. This is one of the things I think is sig- symbolic of the of what I consider their failure. They're going to announce on a Tuesday in New York a press conference to announce that they're having this series of fights on NBC, and they have the first three shows already booked up. And I get a call mid-afternoon on Monday saying, hey, do you want to come to New York for a press conference tomorrow? And, like, that's how, you know, they, they, they were or, disorganized or whatever it was. Intentionally, I think Heyman doesn't care about, you know, um, any PR or marketing. And I know you're different than that. But certainly that, that really affected, you know, from the beginning. But I had written that day, said, hey, this will work if they put on the right fights and they, you know, they keep the quality up. Uh, and they kept the quality up for a couple of weeks and then it fell down. So now Heyman's there, you know, whatever you want to think is several hundred million in the hole. And I'm hearing, you know, potentially he's looking to get out of the business. Have you talked to him at all about maybe usurping his roster of fighters? Cause he has a lot of really good fighters and maybe, you know, bailing him out, so to speak, and taking those fighters and, and starting your company with them. Well, I have a good relationship with Heyman. I actually like him very much. So I think that, um, I think that there are a lot of possibilities, not just with Heyman, but with a lot of people. And like I said, people are interested. And people are coming out to meet with me. I have meetings set up. Um, <laughs> I was supposed to have these meetings all in January, but I'm, tra- I'm traveling so much in January. It's going to happen in January and parts of February. But everybody's coming out, and I'm meeting with everybody. I'm going to listen. You know, I'm going to find out what everybody's thinking, and I'm, I'm going to dive in. I'm, and I'm not coming in to try to – take over the sport or put anybody out of business, including guys like Aaron and De La Hoya. Um, I just, I, I think, I think I could do a good job at it and I want to give it a shot. Two really quick questions. If you have a fighter in boxing and Oscar De La Hoya has the perfect opponent for him, would you co-promote with them given you've been, had a reluctance to co-promote in MMA? Would you do it in boxing? I'm just, I'm so, I'm so disgusted by the way he handled the Mayweather McGregor fight, it's just uh, you know the stuff that he came 
came out and said, then as soon as the fight's over, he says he's in training and he wants to fight McGregor because fighting Floyd was a disgrace, but fighting him wouldn't be. You know what I mean? It's just, just weird. I, I just, I don't know if I could, I don't know if I could deal with Oscar, but you know, crazier things have happened. Me and Tito Ortiz have got things done. So maybe me and Oscar can. So you would be open to co-promoting? If, it, if it, somebody yeah, else, I, not necessarily Oscar, but somebody. I'll never work with Showtime again. Okay. Showtime's out. All right. And then lastly, Anthony Joshua, Deontay Wilder, it would be a heavyweight title unification fight. If that fight happens in 2018, will Dana White be involved? <laughs> I hope so. All right. Well, there you have it. I, I love that. I love that fight. That would be a hell of a fight. You talk about if you promoted that in Stipe and Francis in one year, you might win promoter of the year. It'd be good. It would, <laughs> I'd it even vote suck. for you. Uh, I appreciate it. We'll make it happen. Thank you, Dana. I'm going to try. I appreciate you, brother. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, buddy.